Well, welcome to our first video interview here at Age Civil War. And we're joined today here at Andersonville National Historical Park by David Silkenot, who is a senior lecturer, lecturer at University of Edinburgh. He has published, among other things, Moments of Despair, Suicide, Divorce, and Dead in the Civil War Era, North Carolina, Driven from Home, North Carolina Civil War Refugee Crisis, and now the newest book, Raising the White Flag, How Surrender Defines the Civil War. So my colleague calls that my Civil War Misery Trilogy. Uh, I don't know whether that's accurately describes the contents, but it sounds good. Sounds good, right. So tell us a little about the Surrender book. What's your argument? Uh, so the basic premise of the book, in fact, is a, is a very simple one. Uh, that the Civil War was defined by the frequency in which both Union and Confederate soldiers and armies surrendered. The war began with surrender, famously at, at Fort Sumter. It ends with a series of surrenders uh, at Appomattox Courthouse, at Bennett Place, and a number of other sites. Uh, and in between, you know, there, there are many of the defining moments of the war are defined by surrender. So I'm thinking here about you know, Fort, Fort Donelson, thinking about Harper's Ferry, thinking about Vicksburg. And so the book really began me trying to come to grips with what does it mean that they're surrendering so often? Why do Civil War officers choose to surrender so often? Why do soldiers on the battlefield so often choose to throw down their guns, raise their hands, and and ask to be, be accepted as a prisoner of war? And so that was the basic research question, was trying to make sense of why that happened. And where you say that soldiers threw down their arms, yeah. what, did, what did surrender mean to them? Why did they do it? Uh, so different soldiers surrendered for different reasons. Um, one of the reasons why soldiers surrendered, especially in uh, sort of the middle part of the war, is they actually expected that their conditions as a prisoner of war would be relatively benign. It's kind of ironic that we're doing this here at Andersonville, because Andersonville is, of course, a Confederate prison that's opened in 1864 and is usually the prison people think of when they think of Civil War prisons with, with you know, mass starvation and, and disease and death and, and just uh, really a horrible situation here in Andersonville. But for most of the rest of the war, Civil War soldiers, if they surrendered, expected actually to get moderately good treatment in a prison of war camp. During, uh, in 18, starting in 1862, there's a prisoner exchange regime in place called the Dix Hill Cartel, which meant that if you were captured as a prisoner uh, during, in, a, in a battle, if you surrendered, you would be released within 10 days. Uh, and if you were exchanged for a prisoner on the other side, you could actually go back and fight with your unit again. Um, and so this made, well, one of the things this made was, it made if your choices between, you know, fighting to the death or surrendering, if you are finding yourself outnumbered, or if you're finding yourself surrounded, surrender looks like a very good option. Sure. Uh, and there are limits to this, of course. I mean, there, the, if you are an African American soldier, if you are a Southern Unionist, if you're a guerrilla fighter, the, the same rules don't apply because these, they were not often considered legitimate soldiers by by the enemy, and so they weren't afforded the same privilege to surrender. But for everybody else, for most of the war, surrendering seemed like a really good good option. And you mentioned the cartel of prisoner of war exchange. How does the end of that cartel by early 64 changed the dynamics of surrender. Well, what I argue in the book is that, uh, you know, the cartel breaks down basically because the Confederacy doesn't recognize black soldiers as being legitimate soldiers and refuses to grant them prisoner of war status if they're captured. Uh, and in fact, they're oftentimes actually killed on the battlefield if, they, if they're captured. We think about Fort Pillow or, or the Crater or a number of other examples of this happening. Um, when the prisoner of war exchange breaks down, soldiers increasingly recognize that if they are captured, they're going to end up in a place like Andersonville. And then it becomes a much more desperate choice. If you think you're going to be paroled and exchanged very quickly, surrender seems like a good choice. If, if you get captured and are going to end up in Andersonville, you might as well fight to the death, right? And so one of the things I find in 1864 in particular is soldiers are far less willing to surrender and officers are far less willing to surrender because they know what awaits for them afterwards. Uh, and you know, lots of historians talk about a hard war in 1864, and I think the breakdown of the cartel has something to do with that, because increasingly soldiers recognize that 
surrender is really off the table, and they need to fight in a different, different way. And the war obviously ends with the surrender at, say, Appomattox or Bennett Place, and well, it ends with a series of surrenders, really. Um, you know, and that's one way to think. You know, people often think about Appomattox as the end of the war, and oftentimes it's used as a shorthand for the end of the war. But in fact, one of the things that happens is, you know, each Confederate command has to surrender individually. So there are really a series of surrenders that happen after Appomattox. Sure. And um, how do, how willingly are soldiers surrendering? Are, do you see, like, especially at the end of the war, that some of them are not willing to give up the fight and then embrace like a new confederate yeah. kind of so, well, well the vast majority of soldiers and confederate soldiers are actually i think relieved by surrender especially after appomattox when they realize they're not going to a prisoner of war camp they're going to be paroled they're going to be given rations sometimes they're given transportation depending on the circumstances of the individual surrender uh, so m most confederates i think embrace surrender at the end of the war saying that this is the way to get back home. They're not going to get shot at. They don't have to march anymore. They're, they're happy to do it. There are, though, a handful of Confederates in each Confederate surrender of the war who, who completely reject the idea of surrender. They want to continue to fight on. So there are people who leave Lee's army, the Appomattox Courthouse, and they want to join Johnston's army. And then there are people from Johnston's army who want to join Kirby Smith's army, or Taylor's army, or, or, or Forrest's uh, cavalry. Uh, and so there is, in, in each surrender, a small contingent of people who are absolutely rejecting the idea that this is the end of the war and want to keep fighting. In fact, when Kirby Smith surrenders, there's a contingent of people who decide to go into Mexico because they say, Look, we're not going to live in the United States. We are going to continue to fight. And Mexico is in the middle of a civil war. They said, we're going to fight for whoever will let us fight in that war. And the Mexicans don't really want anything to do with them. Um, but a lot of these guys, I found, go on in the post-war period to form some of the paramilitary organizations that exist during Reconstruction, like the Ku Klux Klan. And I think there's a connection there between refusing to surrender at the end of the war and their sort of affinity for these kinds of terrorist paramilitary organizations in the post-war period. Sure. Um, when you wrote Driven From Home, you indicated in the introduction that this book was kind of driven by the contemporary refugee Jesus crisis that sure. took place. Do you have something similar that um, gave you a rise to write this book? Well, there's there's a there's a couple of, of things that were going on while I, while I was writing this book that really made me think about its resonances uh, in a more contemporary context. Um, one is the Bo Bergdahl case, um, you know, a situation of a, of a soldier in Afghanistan who goes AWOL and gets captured, and the ways in which he was treated, and the ways in which people thought about that particular situation. I mean, the other big you know, moment that, that I think about in the book is there's a, a rhetoric in the United States that starts in the mid-20th century that Americans never surrender. And you find Kennedy saying that in the, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you find Nixon saying that, you find Reagan saying it, that you find Obama saying it. It's, it's really a common unifying political mantra that Americans never surrender. Um, and while I was writing the first draft of this is when um, then candidate Trump called out John McCain and said, mm -hmm. you know, I don't like people who weren't captured, you know, and, 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 and that to me sort of was a distillation in some ways of that idea that, you know, that there's something dishonorable about surrender, that surrender is a shameful activity. And what I think the Civil War teaches us in part is that there's a ways in which you can think about surrender not as a shameful activity, but as a really humanizing and civilizing activity. To mm -hmm. surrender, you have to reckon and to accept somebody else's surrender, whether it's generals sitting across the table from each other, soldiers in the battlefield. You have to say, the person across the table from me is as fully human as I am, and we're going to find a way not to shoot at each other, even if we were shooting at each other just a few minutes ago. Uh, and that, to me, I think is a very powerful idea. Um, so you're about to go on this long book tour. So you're starting here in Andersonville. Yes. And you start the tour at Andersonville, which is like the point where a lot of people that surrender end up. up yes. And eventually you're going to talk at Maddox. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're talking at Bennett. Yes, I'm going to Bennett Place. place. I managed to hit the anniversary of both of those on, on So uh, on you're talking trip. at these places where surrender was the go-to. Yes. And how does that kind of, how does that personalize the story, you say? Well, one of the interesting things about these sites, whether it's places like Andersonville, or it's places like Appomattox Courthouse or Bennett Place, and I talk about this in, in, in a chapter in the book, 
is that Americans have a really hard time figuring out what to do with these sites. Mm -hmm. um, that unlike battlefields, where we, you know, both Union and Confederate veterans know very quickly how to commemorate those sites, they know how to put up monuments, they know what they're supposed to look like, they know what the battle means. Surrender sites, what I find is, is a great deal of difficulty of Americans talking about what it is that happened there. Mm -hmm. And if you go to places like Appomattox Courthouse, you'll find very, very few monuments. There's really only two monuments at Appomattox Courthouse, and one of those is kind of in the woods, and you've got to hunt for it. At Bennett Place, there is a monument, but it's kind of a weird one and a very controversial one. And at lots of these other surrender sites, there's very little monumentation. I think mm. that says something about the ways in which Americans have sort of wrestled with surrender as an idea uh, that's been very difficult for them, and, and that makes it very different from the way people commemorate battlefields. So I'm really looking forward to talking with people at, at these surrender sites on the anniversaries uh, and seeing what brings in there and what, they, what sense they make of what these places mean. Sure. Um, well, good luck on the tour. Thank, thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful trip. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you.